Okay, so we're looking at the poem Love's Philosophy by P.B. Shelley. Now, first of all, make sure you get right in your notes that Shelley is a man. He is Percy Bish Shelley, and he is the Shelley who was married to Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein. As such, he was one of the Romantic poets, and actually that's Romantic with a capital R in terms of the Romantic movement. And the Romantic movement was around in the 1800s, and they really kind of wanted to explore the idea of nature and love and man's place in that. So if you write that something is a romantic idea and you put a capital R on it, you're referring to that. It becomes relevant in this poem when you look at the themes that Shelley is talking about. The other thing to notice is actually the way his name's spelt, that you've got that extra E there. Now, first of all, as we've been doing to look at the title, so Love's Philosophy. So straight away, you end up saying, well, hang on, if love has a philosophy, then love has to be personified here. And a philosophy is a way of thinking. It's the guiding principles. It's the kind of truths of something. So actually, in this poem, Shelley's speaker is claiming he's talking about the guiding principles of love, um, what happens, what rules love. So he's setting up this idea of the guiding principles. Put the eye back in there. Um, all the kind of basic truths of love. So straight away, this poem that was written in 1820 is making a claim that what it's saying is the way of true love, is the way that love has to behave, is the way that love would behave if it was given its own right, its own entitlement. Um, and what Shelley's going to do is he's going to use natural imagery and the natural world to try and write a persuasive poem. In terms of what you compare it with, just bear in mind the idea from Sonnet 29 of extended metaphor, um, the natural imagery, and see whether or not you think that would be a good, um, a good match. Looking at the poem itself then, so, love's philosophy, you've got the fountains mingle with the river, and the rivers with the ocean. The winds of heaven mix forever with a sweet emotion. Nothing in the world is single. All things by a law divine in one spirit meet and mingle. Why not I with thine? See, the mountains kiss high heaven, and the waves clasp one another. No sister flower would be forgiven if it disdained its brother. And the sunlight clasps the earth, and the moonbeams kiss the sea. What is all this sweet work worth if thou kiss not me? Now it may well be that you have a slightly different version um, in the anthology, because I think that there are a couple of different edits hanging around in terms of he made some changes. So please use the version in the anthology and I will try and pick up um, my notes. I think from memory it talks about what all these kissings were in the anthology. But looking at it then. So straight away you've got that idea of na nature. Natural imagery. And this speaker has an agenda. So he has um, an end in mind. He has reasons for saying what he's saying. And the reasons ultimately are that he wants his lover, he wants the lady he's talking to, or the lady he'd like to be his lover, to at least kiss him. At least. So it is a poem of persuasion. You'll read 
in um, the study guides and in kind of critical articles, the idea of it being compa compared with a poem called The Flea. Now, that's not something you need to know, but basically in The Flea, John Donne, a metaphysical poet, uses the idea of, of saying, well, look, you know, this flea has bitten you, this flea has bitten me, so our bodily fluids are basically mingled already in the flea, so why don't we just kind of mingle in real life? Um, you, can, you can judge by yourself what you actually think of that argument. But going back to Shelley, looking first of all, um, you've got the fountains mingle with the river and the rivers with the ocean. So straight away, these bodies of water are getting bigger. There is a natural progression there. And it gives the idea that actually this is inevitable. There is a kind of um, growing power from going to a fountain, to a river, to an ocean. The idea that it is unstoppable, maybe. You'd pick up on the word mingle, that idea of coming together, that idea that everything kind of well, basically gets together. Um, and the speaker's going to use that as an argument to try and say, look, you know, why resist nature? There is an inevitability inevitability in us getting together because everything in the natural world is doing it so you go from the idea of waters to um, winds so you're looking at the elements you're looking at these powerful forces so the fountains with the river the rivers with the ocean the winds of heaven mix forever with a sweet emotion and you can also note the introduction of this religious idea as well. Um, the idea that it's not just nature that's doing this. It is actually um, what God would want as well. There is a spiritual or a divine aspect to it. Divine meaning to do with God. So why, why resist? You get more personification. The winds have sweet emotion. Love is not something to be resisted. It's pleasurable. It's something to be um, embraced. It's something to be enjoyed. So he's using pathetic fallacy. He's using that idea of the setting mimicking the emotion. Everything in nature is, is in pairs. Everything in nature has this kind of romantic embrace. Why are we the only things that's not doing it? So after the first four lines, you get this kind of more decisive tone, this declaration, okay? That nothing in the world is single all things by a law divine and there's that religious link again so they in one spirit again religion meet and mingle why not i with thine so actually there's a couple of things there you've got the repetition of the word mingle okay that's really the purpose um he really wants to kind of get together with her physically, this idea that through sex two people become one, um, the idea that they need to connect. Okay, there is an end stop there to give pause for thought and then a question. And it's a monosyllabic. It's clear, it's direct, it's blunt. It's a short line to emphasise that kind of idea, that question. And it's first person address. It's in the... He is talking to her. Okay, so it's that direct... Um, so it's in the first person, it's a direct address. To the reader and or his lover. Um, you become 
the person who is feeling the um, force of his persuasion, if you like. So, you have this idea that the stanza builds to a rhetorical question. Because actually, what the speaker's intending is that the answer is obvious. Why not I with thine? Well, there is no reason because everything else um, kind of is, is together. You can also argue that the short line has an idea of lack of um, completeness. forgot to change um, page at that point. So um, make sure in your notes you've got the idea of the water, you've got the water getting bigger, you've got repetition of mingle highlighting the agenda, you've got religious imagery used, you've got this um, pathetic fallacy, And these are all being used as persuasive devices to further the speaker's agenda. The final short line is a rhetorical question giving this idea of um, lack of completeness. It's also on its own, like the speaker. It stands out, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't match with anything. And you can see that actually, um, you know, you've got that kind of um, do almost double end stop there that kind of really emphasises the, the question. So, so far the tone is quite playful. It's, it's, it's quite a simple concept. And actually, clearly it hasn't worked because the speaker has to go on and do another um, so. So more examples, again drawn from nature, and again that idea of personification, um, religious imagery, natural imagery. The mountains kiss, the waves clasp one another. Again, personification, the idea that everything in the natural world is paired up, is actually enjoying um, that connection. This little bit, um, I think, is a little bit out of place. No sister flower would be forgiven if it disdained its brother, because obviously after the kind of pairing up imagery, you've got the kind of sister brother side of it. But that idea of the the natural order, natural hierarchy of things, the idea that you know people need people, I guess. Disdained means to kind of reject not to acknowledge, not to treat favourably. So it kind of implies that actually rejecting um, the natural order of things is, is kind of unnatural. Um, it hints at rejection, maybe he's not being um, heard favourably. And that the whole idea is if it's, you know, it's the forgiveness has this idea of um, going against divine will. You know, the idea of religious forgiveness. You've got the idea of the clasping, the sunlight clasps the earth. So you're kind of moving to a cosmic scale. So far we've had imagery that's, that's relied on the earth. We've been confined to the planet, if you like. Whereas now we get to this idea of, of the sun, um, the earth, the moon, everything is, is, is kind of on this huge scale, this vast scale is, is getting together. And then this version says, what is all this sweet work worth if thou kiss not me? I think that actually checking your anthology... Um, Yes, on line 15, you have, what are all these kissings worth if thou kiss not me? So both of these idea, work or kissings, it means that actually, if she doesn't respond to him, 
then she is devaluing what's going on. Okay, there is she's taking away, she's undermining what's happening. Um, and actually, again, it's it's the same effect as before that rhetorical question. It's building to that climax. Those short lines are separated from the rest of the stanza, like the speaker is separated from their lover. So, looking at at this idea, the idea that you know humanity should mirror nature, that if she doesn't. Um, do what he wants if he does she doesn't give in to him and bearing in mind context wise the idea that a woman's honor a woman's sexual behavior um a woman had to be um chased and that is chased not as in the farmer's bride chased over the hills but chased as in kind of sexually pure very sexually reserved um this would be a poem kind of of, of some force of some impact you know the woman couldn't say yes because the consequences for her would be much, much greater than the consequences for the man. So looking at it from a form and structure perspective, wrong way, what have you got? Well, you've got two stanzas of eight lines. So you've got two octets. And the rhyme scheme is regular, and it goes A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D. So even the poem itself is written in couplets, in couplets which have a, this kind of alternating rhyme scheme. You have a number of confident assertions going on. Um, you have the questions at the end giving that sense of you know, the whole stanza building up to a question. Um, you have sometimes there's not a full rhyme there, so it's not quite in harmony. So heaven forgiven, for example. Um, so like the speaker and his lover, it's not quite connected in some places, but it's getting there. You've also got um, a nice point about the form echoing the content. Okay. Now, sometimes there are endings to a line which are known as feminine endings and sometimes there are masculine endings. And a masculine ending is where a stress, the beat, hits the last syllable of, of the line. A feminine ending or a weak ending, make what you want of that, um, so it's masculine or strong or feminine or weak, some it, that's where you you uh, end on a syllable that's not stressed so sometimes you get feminine endings for example the word river so a uh, kind of falls away so the stress is on riv you get single um so the stress is on the first syllable and sometimes you get masculine endings like ocean earth so it, it kind of hits that final thing, which is a strong ending. So Shelley blends masculine and feminine endings to actually echo his argument that the masculine and feminine should be mixing, should be blending together. So where do you go from here? What oh, with this poem? Now it is time for this slide. So what I've done is put three places you can look. Um, this one, first of all, is from Madame Anglaise. She is online if you search for um, Madame Anglaise you, and then Love and Relationships Poetry, you'll get critiques of all of the poems. And actually you can see here she is doing a far more detailed kind of technical analysis. She talks about the fricative sounds um, of the F, the W, the H, the sh sound, um, give it a breathy, soft feel. Um, she, you know, the, there's the sibilance, there's the high heaven that talk about breathiness, that talks about a sort of sense of urgency. If you like that kind of idea, that sense of flow, read that, make some notes. You've again got the art of poetry. If you're after an eight or a nine, I would very, very much recommend you reading all of those, possibly even buying the book. There's 
copies of it on Firefly, but the book is available on Amazon, and it looks like that. You're looking for Neil Bowen, AQA Love and Relationships, The Art of Poetry. And then finally, there are the slice notes as well. Um, and for each of those, you notice that takes a structure point, a language point, a context point, and an effect or exploration to really make sure that if you are looking at um, one quotation, it's really working for you. Now, I notice the one I've picked here is the sweet work worth. And it talks here about the alliteration of work, worth and what. Um, you can say, if you could remember that, that actually, you know, in some versions, this is sweet work worth. Um, for this one, you can say, what are all these kissings worth? You can make the same point about kiss and kissings there in terms of tying it together linguistically. So the same point applies to either version of the poem. Hopefully that helps. Um, please do make sure that you thoroughly understand each poem. I would very much recommend that you take your notes further using at least one of those three um, sources. And don't forget, there is also Mr. Bruff. Any questions, ultimately ask me. OK, bye.